The first time I heard that type of line used on rhythm changes, I'm very sure I had to hit rewind a couple times on the track just to try to check it out and see what was going on. Today, we are talking about how to superimpose circle of fifths progressions on the A section of rhythm changes to create what I consider to be the ultimate reharm on this standard. What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining me this week. Today, we are digging into rhythm changes, specifically a very particular reharm for the A sections of rhythm changes. This is using circle of fifths progressions. You'll hear this all over the place, across the language, lots of different players applying it in different ways. It's a really like, I think, common part of the sort of bebop vocabulary on this tune, but also one that, you know, if you play it in a swinging way and use it in sort of like an elegant way of moving through these ideas, it almost never gets tired, at least to my ears. So the first place I encountered this was my teacher in undergrad directed me to a recording by the tenor saxophone player Don Bias with the bass player Slam Stewart. It is literally a duo recording. They play rhythm changes. They play quite a few courses each, but Don Bias uses this concept. He plays this line. Before we take that line and a couple other ones apart today, we really have to understand why this works from a music theory standpoint. So when we're in the A sections of rhythm changes, our first four bars are one, six, two, five, one, six, two, five, basically. We know in bar five, we are getting to a B flat dominant seventh chord. We're gonna talk in terms of B flat today. So that's kind of our target. This is a classic reharm that we need to know that target and then we work backwards to get there. So leading up to that B flat dominant seventh chord, we might think we have either a one, six, two, five or a three, six, two, five. So whenever we have a three, six, two, five progression, this is a progression that is moving counterclockwise around our circle. We go from D to G to C to F, eventually to B flat. That is really like classic functional harmony. So by knowing this, we can actually just extend back a few more steps around that circle, really however far we want to go and just cram that in on top of the changes that are there. In our case, we're trying to fill up two more chords all the way back to the beginning, excuse me, two more measures all the way back to the beginning of the A section. So we need to go a couple more steps around the circle. So what we're gonna actually do when we're in the key of B flat, we're gonna start in bar one of our A sections on a G flat dominant seventh chord. And all of these chords are gonna be dominant working their way around all the way to B flat in bar five. G flat to B to E to A to D to C to F to B flat. And so it's all about this idea of knowing where we're going and then working our way backwards with all of these being dominant chords because our ear is so accustomed to hearing these dominant resolutions of them moving forward. And then eventually when they get to their eventual fully kind of resolved point, it sort of feels good for our ear. If we now circle back to Don Bias's line, we can hear he takes this approach and outlines the changes in a super clear fashion. So in the first measure, it's actually slightly different than the actual cycle he implies. He just goes straight up that G flat dominant seventh arpeggio, resolves to the third from the seventh of G flat to the third of B7, and then just works the way down through B7, resolving from the seventh to the third for the E chord. And then this is really where the cycle that he implies. We start on the third. We have three, five, root, flat seven to the third of the next chord, then down that scale, three, five, root, flat seven to the next chord. So he creates this cycle all the way down, resolving to the B7 chord. This is the substitution that we're trying to deal with today. So what we wanna think is that rather than starting on one in the beginning of the A sections, we are gonna start on the chord that is the flat six of the key. So in this case, it's G flat, make that a dominant chord and then just run through our cycle. And there's tons of different patterns and things you can work on to just create interesting melodies through this. Another great one that you'll hear all over the place is when we start on the third of that flat six chord. So we're actually starting on B flat and we have three, five, root, flat seven, to three, five, going up for the root to flat seven of the next chord. Super, super classic. If we hear this against some chords, you'll probably find that this is something you've heard before on recordings. Now, 
out, you might have noticed midway through, I changed the cycle ever so slightly. If we play this all the way from the beginning and we just play the cycle as is. My brain is starting to think, hmm, I'm starting to get kind of low in the range. Now, if I don't want to go that low into the range, which I may not, especially if I'm moving at a quick tempo, I could choose wherever in that cycle to change the octave. In the case of what I played with the play along, I decided in the third measure, I was going to change the direction I was going. So rather than going down through the little cell, I decided to go up. And then this is one is where I change. And then I go up again, da, 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 and then I resume the cycle to start or how it originally uh, was played. So you gotta have a little flexibility if you wanna move this all around the horn. It takes a fair amount of practice of working these small little chunks, but it's very, very useful. And just thinking something simple like, where am I in the range can sometimes help you decide what to do. Now, those are all very eighth note driven lines. And especially as tempos get faster, for us as trombone players, that can just be challenging to execute. But you can do this off of much simpler ideas that maybe don't rely so heavily on just a stream of moving eighth notes the entire time. It's all about looking for those third, seventh type of resolutions. Here we just take a really simple motive. I start on the root of the G flat chord go down to the flat seven and do an enclosure around the third of the B7 chord, eventually resolving to that root. That's the idea. And then we just move that through the rest of the changes, hitting that on each change. It gives us this nice cyclical type of idea that is just sounds inherently melodic, even though it's really just applying a cycle through these chord changes. When you take this stuff into the practice room, you have to start by spending a fair amount of time just working these individual little cells or individual little motives that you can then move around the circle in this fashion. There's, there's a bunch of these. These are just a couple of examples that I've shared today, but lots of different ways you can manipulate these. The key is once you get some good practice on those, can you sort of interpolate them and start to mix them up, change rhythms, sometimes use a little bit of one and a little bit of another. That can give you a little bit more natural, organic type of feel rather than just feeling like I'm sort of cutting and pasting these into my solos. All right, there is this reharm. So Relatively basic to understand on sort of a foundational level, but definitely something you gotta take into the practice room, practice it slow, so you can actually start to hear these ideas. And the next time that you're listening to somebody play rhythm changes, if they go to this way of approaching the harmony, you'll be like, oh, I know what that is, and maybe you can grab onto just a few of the ideas that they're using and maybe get them into your own playing. Cool, we'll see you in the woodshed. <laughs>